seat, please. Thank you all very much for coming. I want to welcome you to what is the, the sixth lecture in the series of educational presentations by the New Atomic Testing Museum. My name is Troy Wade. I'm a 45-year resident of Las Vegas and spent most of that time on the test site. I'm retired for 40 years in the nuclear weapons program, and I'm currently chairman of the Nevada Test Site Historical Foundation, a parent organization of the, the New Atomic Testing Museum. Before I introduce our distinguished speaker, let me say a few words about the museum and the schedule for completion. This beautiful new building here in, which, which is part of the Desert Research Institute, was actually uh, uh, dedicated in October of 2003, so the building is, is brand new. Uh, it's named the Frank Rogers Science and Technology Building, named after Frank H. Rogers, who was the first RICO superintendent of the test site when the test site was founded and was established in 1951. The building already has in it two major collections. On the second floor is the extensive collection of Native American artifacts collected by the DRI. And also on the second floor in the reading room next door are the nuclear testing archives, which contain information on every nuclear test conducted and on the people that participated in those tests. And in the far end of the hallway, scheduled for completion in December of this year, is the permanent exhibit area of the Atomic Testing Museum. Uh, between here and there, and we hope you'll take a look, is this gift shop for the museum. There's what we call the Changing Exhibit Hall. This museum is an affiliate of the Smithsonian. The Changing Exhibit Hall <clears throat> is a place where we will exchange exhibits with other museums and other companies and other, and other sites around the complex, and they'll change out every six months. On the far end is, is what we call a permanent exhibit area, which you will enter when it opens through uh, what is meant to look like a, a, a test site guard post. And when you go in, you will walk through 50 years of history, uh, beginning in when the test site was formed in 1951 and continuing until testing ended in 92 and then through today. The, uh, the final construction is underway. Uh, the exhibits are being fabricated in New Jersey, as a matter of fact. Uh, there are lots of people in that area right now that are making modifications to uh, the walls and the floors to hang the exhibits. And I'm told that this all will fit together like a big jigsaw puzzle when they start arriving about mid-month. Uh, and it'll take a couple of months to get all of their fabricated things in and then all of the artifacts which, which, we, which are at the test site in Southern Town. The, uh, the schedule is that they're supposed to hand us the keys on December the 15th. It will be complete on December the 15th. Uh, we will then spend the next month or so debugging all the systems because the museum, the permanent exhibit area, is about 40% multimedia. So there's lots of selections, lots of screens for you to look at. And the grand opening is scheduled for the weekend of February 19th and 20th. February 20th is the first day that the museum will be open to the public. We hope you all will put that on your calendar and plan to be here on the 20th. I think you'll be very pleased and uh, a surprise when you when you see what has happened. Uh, I might just add that, that uh, for, for those of you in the room, when we open this, when it's completed in December, between the time it's completed in December 15th and we open in February 20th, we need a lot of things. We need a lot of volunteers. <clears throat> we need a lot of doses. We need security people. 
Uh, we are an affiliate of the Smithsonian, and there are certain regulations that they are going to hold us to. And so we, uh, I urge any, any of you who are interested to please contact us tonight. Come down and volunteer. Of course, we, we would like you all to join the foundation as well and support the museum. But the volunteers are what we're really looking for at the moment. So, so after, after the lecture, please, please talk to us, talk to Maggie Smith, and, and sign up as a volunteer. When the museum opens, and we have then three collections in the building, we will have one of the most unique educational uh, tools in Southern Nevada with those three collections. And one of the things we've done from the outset is consider that this will be used as an educational tool with uh, everything from K-12 to the university classes. And one of the things we've also set out to do is to have uh, speakers, prominent speakers, uh, experts in their own, own fields come in and, 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 and lecture. And we're particularly honored tonight to have uh, an internationally known expert as the sixth lecturer in our series. Tony Brooks is Professor of Radiation Toxicology at Washington State University Tri-Cities in Richmond. Professor Brooks is an expert in radiation ecology health effects of radiation, internally positive radiation, cancer radiation, public outreach, and low-dose radiation risk. He is extensively published and has served on many boards and committees, including the National Academy of Sciences, the National Institutes of Health, and is a member of the National Council on Radiation Protection and Measurements. Dr. Brooks has been interested in and involved with the NTS for many years, and, and, and he and I have been today and we we did meet many years ago. He uh, has chased Paul out in southern Utah through his scientific pursuit of potential health effects from those exposures. And in fact, he and our own Bruce Church, who many of you know, are doing a combined, combined presentation in St. George tomorrow night on the same subject. His knowledge of the testing program and its effects make this a particularly important lecture in our continuing series. We're delighted to have him. Would you please welcome to the podium, Dr. Tony Brooks. Thank you. I uh, hope you can hear me. I'm really happy to be here. It's uh, going to be an exciting time for me. I hope that by the time I'm through today that you will have learned some things you didn't know. And I hope that by the time I'm through today that you'll be able to put in perspective some of the problems we have. We can all recognize that I believe that cancer is a serious disease. And when you get it, it's a serious disease. And I want you all to recognize that I've spent my life trying to uh, find out what the association is between radiation exposure and the production of cancer. So I titled my talk uh, today, uh, are we slaying dragons or jousting windmills? I want you to know that when I started out, I was interested in radiation because I lived in St. George, Utah. My dad, uh, Will Brooks, my mom, Mommy Brooks, used to get us up early in the mornings. We'd go outside, they would announce in the newspaper, they could have a test. We'd go out and watch, and the whole sky, of course, would light up. And you could how long it was before it stopped, they did. We thought that was pretty neat. Good job, they how far you were, how far out the test like that and went off. And so uh, I have my interest kind of tweaked as, as a young child. My get to be back. Not anymore. All <laughs> <laughs> new. For a moment, I'm still mobile. Uh, so I, I started out with this interest in it. Then I went off to the University of Utah. And, uh, my mother was a teacher, and when I told her I wasn't going to be a teacher, and she was highly disappointed. She said, well, what are you going to do? Here you've got a bachelor's degree in biology, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I took a class teaching biology in high school, and uh, I don't want no part of it. So anyway, about that time, they were testing the above ground in Nevada, and a man named Dr. Robert Hamilton got a grant from the Department of Energy to follow the 
fallout as it moves through the food chain of people. And so I spent my master's degree chasing fallout in Utah. We had a big network of milk stations all over the state. Each weekend we'd run off, we'd go north to the Cash Valley, and we'd go east, and then we'd go south, and then we'd go up, get all the milk that we could. And of course they were testing, and we had radiation and everything. It was in everything, it was on everything, it was everywhere. In fact, uh, I got married the 24th of July, I got married in LA. 24th of July, so the people can never, I can remember my anniversary. Because a lot of people celebrate the 24th of July in Utah, so I was able to remember that day. But while I was doing that, there was a test in Nevada, and uh, the milk was, in the salt big milk shed was contaminated, and so my boss went out there on his own and started converting trucks. Out of which I'm sure he'd be thrown in jail if he did that today. Anyway, let me tell you, I was as concerned as anybody. We were jousting dragons. We were fighting dragons. I was sure that this was a very, very serious problem. It was everywhere, it was on everything, it was in everything. The question I came back to is it doing anything? What are the health effects of low doses of radiation? And that's where I spent my life most. Trying to decide now. Got a PhD in radiation biology and genetics at Cornell University where I switched then from straight chasing fallout to looking at the effects. I went from there to uh, the level of simulation pharmacology research where we had animals inhale radioactive material, we exposed them to all different kinds of radioactive material. We studied them for their lifespan. I got interested in chromosomes because that was the most sensitive indicator of damage. So you can measure chromosomes how much radiation someone has. We can take a blood sample out of you folks here and look at it and get a good idea of how much radiation exposure you had if you got the blood sample very soon after the radiation. So then I've gone from there to say, okay, it's all and everything, we've contaminated the world, folks. We've done the experiment. We've had a lot of accidents besides that since then. Chernobyl and a lot of others. What are the health effects? Now let me tell you the problem. We've got two problems when we start trying to find out the health effects of radiation. Number one problem is that we have background radiation. Okay? These are the problems. You have background radiation, you have background rate of cancer. When you're trying to sort out the background rate of cancer, from a low dose, you can't see anything. To a high dose, so we're not looking for needles in the haystack, we're looking for hay in the haystack. We're trying to see if it's just a little bit extra hay because the high doses and low doses of radiation. The low doses, it's very difficult to find that. The reason, again, is because radiation is everywhere. We inhale it, we eat it, we breathe it, we eat bananas, a lot of potassium poured in bananas, and you look at your wife, she's radioactive, she's going to radiate you. So there's radiation everywhere, folks. We can't get away from it. We live in the city of radiation. There's nothing much we can do about that. Now we can change that. You know, I live now in New Mexico, elevation 5,000 feet. I got a lot more radiation there than I did when I moved up to Richmond, Washington, where all the waste is, elevation, sea level. But radiation is everywhere, so we have a background. Now what you're going to do then is add some radiation to that background. Here's what we get normally. Radon gas, the human body, say <laughs> that's just natural material that's in your body, brought from soil, medical procedures. Quite a big contributor to the background radiation. Now, one of the problems we have is, is units. And uh, whenever, I think we've done ourselves a terrible disservice because we just about got understanding what rats and rims were and changed the seed of without understood what a micro curie was, we changed it to background. And so everybody, nobody understands the units very well, especially people who don't spend their life studying it, even those that, those that do. So it's confusing. So I put this little slide together to give people a perspective of how much radiation exists in different areas. Quite often they'll talk about the bullying and having cancer therapy 
in one voice and in the same sentence talk about environmental radiation. I just want to show you this quickly. These right here are recorded in Billy Sievers. If you want to change them to Billy Ramchak, two more Sievers. Okay? So if you're going to go get cancer therapy, they really could have seen you. Uh, the total tumor dose can be as high as those. You can have total body therapy in this range. Now, if you go down a factor of 10, this is where most of the radiation biology was done. And here's the human LD50. About 3,000 millisieverts, or 3 sieverts, or 300 grams, 3 to 400 grams. So that's what will kill half of you. Now, why don't we die up in the cancer therapy? Well, we're just shooting the cancer cells. So there's a lot of normal body that's exposed. But when we do that, I want you to know that there's a lot of tissue that's radiated to low doses. And so they've done extensive studies following up those people to see what kind of cancers they develop as a result of the radiation therapy. And that information fits into the whole risk estimate. Now we go down another factor. And there's your AMOG survivors. We'll talk more about them later. Down another factor of 10, here's the cancer epidemiology. If you go there, you can see a significant increase in cancer rate, about 220 sieverts and 20 rams. Here's a typical dose you get at the International Space Station. Go down another factor of 10. This is where the DOE Low Dose Radiation Research Program is focusing now. So we used to do radiation biology two factors and two odds higher than that. So now we're going down to where we can actually see what's going on with these lower doses. The top dose of here is 100 million sieverts for 10 ram. And here's the occupation limit, 5. And you can fall out some point 3 uh, with the average dose in, in St. George. You go on down another factor of 10. We go to medical diagnostic. Here's where the natural background fits in. So you want to understand that if you get below this, you go what you can. You know, if you add to that, then you're adding small amounts. Commercial airline, flight crews, bone scans, thyroid, so on. We go on down to regulatory standards. We're going on down another whole pack of 10 to get your regulatory standards. Goes to the public, site commissioning, NCCR. We have huge arguments with the, between the EPA and the NRC on cleanup standards. You see what they're arguing about, okay? This is a billion dollar argument. That money wisely invested. Good question. And then finally, we go on down to three mile island and negligible doses and things like that. So, I just show this quickly to give you an idea of the range of doses that we're exposed to in everyday activity. You go into therapy, a lot of different types of diagnostics, you're getting a lot of radiation doses. 200 million x rays a year, that's about one per person per year. 100 million dental x-rays, 10 million doses of radio pharmaceutical, 67 million CAT scans. CAT scan gives you really a pretty good dose. 8 million radiation cancer therapy patients per year. So it's not like we haven't had some experience, folks. We've radiated a ton of people in a ton of different conditions, and we follow these people to try to find out how much cancer we get. So we got a lot of experience. It's not that we don't know anything. Now, that's half the problem. The other half is background cancer. Okay, what causes cancer? Now, this is taken out of the World Health Organization. Cigarette smoke, big care. Diet and nutrition is next. Chronic infections, occupational exposure. Genetic components. I happen to have ankylosing spondylitis. I think Grandpa Levitt had ankylosing spondylitis. Two of my kids have ankylosing spondylitis. We're blessed and very large in the back then. There are certain families that are cancer prone. There are a whole series of genes that we're finding out about that predispose these to cancer. Spontaneous frequency of cancer is high. You got BRAC1, BRAC2 gene, breast cancer rate is high. So we sometimes can make a blame grandpa for some of our problems, although we can't, you know, my family, they blame it on me and I blame it on the wife. But <laughs> we have why we cover our bad genes and so our kids can turn out a third long. But you can see here then when you come down to environmental factors, including radiation, that's where the World Health Organization puts it. Okay? 
Now, you say, well, that's not the way the meeting is. This is another very interesting graph I found. Uh, this is the catch mortality rates by county, white males, 1970 to 1994. And if you talked about a 20 year life period for cancer, not a bad time frame. That's kind of an interesting graph, isn't it? We all go to look exactly where we live as soon as I put this graph on. Everybody wants to look, oh, I live up in the state of Washington. King County over on the corner there. They're always coming and hollering us about the risk that we're having from cancer. They got more cancer than we do. I was raised here in southern Utah, right there in St. George. That's where I call the fallout land. This right here is the bottom 10 percentile of the cancer rate. This is the top 10 percentile. So you make part of all the cancers in the country. This is what you get, folks. This is an NIH diet graph. There's a whole book on these graphs that are very fun to look at. Now, if I was the head of the world, in charge of all research, I was like, what the crap's going on in Mississippi River? What's going on in the Mississippi River? Now, we have a cancer epidemic in Utah. Half the national average. Lost 10% of the total cancer. Okay, is that a cancer epidemic? Now, when I give this to talk to uh, people outside of this immediate area, I said, why is that? Why is that? It's a little bit like if we had a big dog colony down in the University of California, Davis, and they, uh, some people came in and said, you know, the dogs aren't happy. You ought to put them out in homes, so they'd be a lot happier. So they took a bunch of the control dogs, put them in homes, so those are the dogs they kept in the lab. The life expectancy of the dogs in the lab was a little over twice that of the dogs in the homes. You say, well, why is that? The dogs in the home get run over by cars, folks. You take the car out of the dog's life, you can really increase his life expectancy, right? <laughs> if you take cigarette smoking out of people's life, you can change cancer. So in a sense, this is a little bit misleading, isn't it? A lot of these people in that area don't smoke cigarettes. And because of that, the cancer rate is way down. Now, does that mean they didn't get any cancer? Because of radiation? No, it doesn't. So it tells me the radiation may play a role, but it's not one of the big hitters. It's not the big hitters. It's not the thing we shouldn't be spending all our time worrying about. Personal opinion. This is the other thing that we have to remember. We're all going to die. Each and every one of us. It's guaranteed. As we, as our survival curve turns, I'm not getting 65, 66, just on the downward hill of that survival curve goes down. All my friends are dying off. Time that breaks down, the cancer curve breaks up. If you live to be 100 years old, the probability of having cancer is almost 100 percent like this way is. Your body controls and regulates and takes care of things as you get older and just don't do as well. My brother always says, you know, getting old isn't persistence. That's really true, because things are breaking down. But that's the way it is. Now, is there a fallout induced cancer epidemic? Well, I span a little above the national average in the high fallout areas. Cancer is lost in the country the data suggests no why the concern? All that existed. Everybody was exposed. Everyone was exposed. And now the government is paying people if you get the right kind of cancer and live in the right place. And so in a sense, they've admitted to it kind of thing. I've often wondered why they did that. One reason it's a lot cheaper to pay it off is to buy it. Why is there more radiation in this cancer? This is the thing that really struck me as I've done my research. Radiation is a poor mutagen. It does not produce mutations very well. It's a poor carcinogen, but it's a very good cell killer. That's why we use it in therapy. That's why we shoot cancer cells with it to kill them. If you try to do a mutation experiment with radiation, you have to little old lump of them and start killing them all off and gnawing yourself with If you do it with a lot of different chemicals, you can get a ton of mutations get cancer in each and every animal. Okay? So in some sense, radiation is not a very good carcinogen.
religion. It's not a good mutagen, but it is a very good cell group. It's very useful as that. Now, if you have high doses, then you have radiation sickness. There's no question about that, is there? You get high doses, you kill lots of cells, you get radiation sickness, and there's lots of diseases associated with that. We won't argue that one at all. But low doses don't kill any cells. Dead cells don't cancer, cause cancer, and a lot of the damaged cells seem to be able to be repairable with lower doses. Now, how do we link radiation to cancer? These are just some of the ways we link them. I'd like to spend just a minute going through the A1 a little bit. And it's kind of interesting data because we all, all know about it. Killed 100,000 people, boom. Terrible weapon. A lot of those people were killed by high doses of radiation when they had acute radiation sickness. It's a terrible thing. We have 86,572 people that were not killed by the radiation, which they followed them for the rest of their life. It's been about 60 years now. And they follow these individuals each and every year with a physical exam. They know exactly why each and every one of them has died over this period of time. Now, if you remember, about 25% of us get cancer anyway. How many extra cancers were there because of the radiation that you were seeing on the side? I asked that question in the eighth grade class once. Of course, the kids were just opposite and they were asleep about that anyway. So I whipped a dollar out of the wall. I said, okay, I'll give the kid a dollar. It comes the closest to estimating the number of excess cancer. Well, every hand went up. Well, I couldn't get any of those kids to come down to less than doubling the cancer rate. A lot of them thought that radiation caused cancer in everybody. They know that it's incredible hope. Mutant <laughs> mutant ancient turtles and Spider-Man, that's all radiation. That's what they're taught, and that's all they know. Okay? So what's the real answer? It'd be fun to do it for this audience and see what kind of numbers you come up with. We have 86,572 people. The total cancers observed after the bomb were 8,180. The expected without the bomb were 7,743. That gave us a grand sum total then for 437 excess cancers. All those that were 334 solid tumors, 104 leukemia. It's over 437. So when you look at that, in some ways that's a tragedy, isn't it? It's real tragic that we have an extra 400 people with cancer. But the atomic bomb killed 100,000. And we produced an extra 400 cancers. So in a sense, if you survive the blast, you're probably not too bad off if you're one of those 86,000 folks. Okay? So this is kind of what I try to do to say, well, this is Hiroshima. This is about as big a dose you can ever get. And you take this and put it to Utah, you put it to Chernobyl, you put it to other examples, and then you try to use this information to calculate the risk. The NCRP uses this information and comes up with a number that's called 5% receiver. Nobody knows what the crap that means, 5% receiver. That's what they tell everybody. Nobody knows what it means. But what it really means is that if you've got 100 grams in one seaver, your cancer rate will go up 5% above that okay? So if you're talking about milli sievers, go down three decimal places, it's not 5%. Three decimal places, you're talking about milligrams, go down two more decimal places. So if you get a few milligrams, then it's 0.5%. Okay? So that's the problem. Now, what are we going to do about that problem? We really need to know how cancer is caused, and how radiation produces cancer if it does, and how much it produces. We can't just go on drawing lines. We've got to get down and understand it. So we've got a 10-year program to look, look at low doses and what cancer those produce, and what the molecular cancer are producing. This is important. I've been having fun with over the last several years. Not more than that. 
trying to decide what why do we want to study it now? See, standards were set from high doses extrapolated down. When we got down low doses, you couldn't see anything. But then we got new techniques, new technology. We sequenced the genome. We're able to very rapidly look at gene expression, gene changes. And we go down and try to find the molecular basis of cancer and how radiation causes it. So that's where we are now, trying to do that. So in the past, all we did, we had data in this region, we drew a straight line down there, we had models, linear null threshold, absolutely straight, but we had a black box. Had no data in the black box. So what we're trying to do now is put some data in the black box. And I think these kind of data will be very helpful when we start trying to understand what we see in a lot of these exposures that we're experiencing in Utah and Nevada these kind of places. Then we can actually start understanding it rather than just getting emotional about it. So what we're trying to do now is generate data down in the black box. And we're actually finding a lot of data down in these very low dose ranges. We got sensitive techniques and we go down to the look we look where we need to be able to. So we got technological advances and biological advances. For example, when I was working in Pacific Northwest lab, we developed this alpha particle radiation system where you hook the gener or, uh, accelerator to a microscope, you accelerate alpha particles and shoot them, bend them up, and even right in the cell, bang, right in the center of the cell. Then you know exactly which cell you hit. You can study that individual cell, and you can study its neighbors. When I was a youngster, I thought you had to hit a cell with radiation in order to damage. I thought you had to hit a cell of radiation in order for it was involved. What's happened is that you can take this microbeam and shoot it exactly where you want. First time we did it, I was doing a biology lab, he was doing a physics, and he was shooting these cells, and I wasn't seeing biological responses, but unless you hit them, you're sure I'm hitting them. So anyway, I made him go back and do some target practice, and you can see that he can put these alpha particles exactly 10 microns apart. And out of the 100 shots, he could put, it, put about 96 of them. Exactly where the city was. So each and every cell we're shooting, we were shooting. So then we can study the cancer mechanisms at high doses and at low doses. We didn't be able to do it at low doses. Now we can. For example, now you can take these things they call gene chips, and you can put a whole series of different genes on one chip. You can take cells, you can radiate them. Extract the DNA, extract the RNA, put them on these gene chips, and you can see what cells are changing. Now, when I was a youngster, we used to make a joke. It was one graduate student, one gene, one master's degree. You would just take a graduate student, change to a chair, and he'd work for two years, and he'd be able to tell you quite a bit about one individual gene. With these gene chips, you can do 15,000 genes at a time. When you have three chips, you just about cover the whole genome. So you can look at all of the genes that are changing as a function of radiation exposure. Now to me, that's really exciting. And then I can tell you what's happening. I don't have to speculate anymore. I can say, this is what happens when you're ready to sell. These are the genes that are upregulated. These are the genes that are downregulated. These genes play this role. These genes play that role. And see what happens if we found that when you do that, you get a very different set of genes with high doses and even low doses. So if you put two gray or 200 grams or 0.1 gray or 1 rad, you can see you have a completely different set of genes turned on. You have 191 genes turned on the low doses, 200 the high doses, and then there's some common ones. But what does that tell you? Something different is happening for low doses and high doses. And then this is just more of that same kind of stuff. So what happens then, if you have a set of low dose genes that are turned on, upregulated and downregulated, if you go higher in dose, a set of high dose genes that come on. So now that we understand what these genes do, then we can start thinking even about therapy, can't we? If we get them turned on and we can turn them off, that's good. So we can actually regulate up and down regulate these genes. 
found the low dose radiation response to modulate genes to follow the stress response, signaling the cell cycle control to the antisepsis repair, suggesting the low dose may activate and protect repairing mechanisms. Now I'm going to talk about three different kinds of responses. I'm going to go through them quite quickly. I get the feeling almost that you feel a little like I did when I was working on Lovelace Foundation. We work with our lab is way out in the desert. We have about a half hour drive every day back and forth. And I rode out there with a guy named Dr. Pickle. Dr. Pickle's dad was a pig farmer in Missouri. And every day he told me about pig farming. We're a half hour out and half hour back. <laughs> By the time I've lived with him for about a year, I knew more about pig farming than ever was known. <laughs> I'm getting the feeling maybe I should learn more about basic radiation biology than ever want to know, but I'm going to forge on through these, these three other things. Because I think they're important because they change the way we think about how radiation acts in this sense. They change the basic paradigm of how we think. First, they call it the bystander effect. Cells respond without energy being given to be positive. If one cell, other cells can respond. Cells communicate. You get one cell that sends signals to the next guy and tells them what's going on. We know that. I mean, when we develop, we start with an egg and sperm, and we have the same genes. And some of them turn on and some of them turn off, and they end up looking like they did. You very seldom see anybody with a liver in their eyeball because the genes aren't turned on to do that. That's the way it's all apparently orchestrated control program. And you can actually get materials released in the media that will alter other cells. The next one is adaptive response. All small doses alter the response to large doses. And small doses can actually decrease spontaneous damage and genomic instability. It's a loss of genetic control when you generate adaptive radiation. So I'm going to go through these three phenomena just really quickly with you. They're all interrelated phenomena. Adaptive response, genomic instability, and bystander effect. Talk about bystander for this arm machine to take and shoot one cell in it, hit it right in the heart. And then you look at that cell and you look at its neighbors. Lo and behold, all its neighbors were turning on and uh, setting up signals. This was kind of different. You know, the way we've been taught, you thought that an alpha particle hits a cell and kills it, for the most part. Here, an alpha particle hits a cell, it sends off a whole series of signals. Well, if you hit each and every cell with one particle, or you get one cell, 10% of cells with one particle. Now, our classic way of thinking, you think, well, hitting all the cells be more than average. Now, it's the same. Okay? So this bystander effect can actually be detrimental, can it? It can be either detrimental or beneficial. And I think that's one of the things that's going to work out here. So we're going to understand what it does. The hot particle hypothesis is one that I was heavily involved in where it uh, was proposed that since a plutonium particle has an alpha particle range of only about 40 microns, only goes through a few cells, that the cells close to the particle would get huge radiation doses. And because of those huge doses, would have a very high cancer. So being a dumb biologist, I said, okay, let's, let's try it. So we took the plutonium particle, we got sort of by size, went down my aerosol sinus, and I said, Otto, I want a toy particle with one micron, half micron, a tenth micron in size, so I can put different amounts of toy in different places. And he says, you act like you're ordering a loaf of bread, you don't ask, you don't even know what you're asking for, that's impossible. I said, do it, and he did. <laughs> so then I took this, the, those particles and injected them into the jugular sinus, they went to the liver and lodged, and so then, we undertook a whole series of study of this. This is, this is some petroleum deposit in the lung. You can see these little hot particles in there. The cells sitting next to those particles are getting tremendous radiation doses. The others are getting almost nothing. So we put these different particle sizes in the liver of the Chinese hamster. Then I studied the chromosome aberrations produced in the liver, cancer produced in those. Well, and they hold it didn't matter what the particle size was. Very big surprise to me. I thought that it would make a huge difference. It didn't. What that says is that the whole liver is responding. You hit one cell, it sends messages to all the other cells. And so the hot particle hypothesis didn't hold any water at all. The, rate, the, the total exposure to the total argument is what's important. 
same thing with capturing the particles. It didn't matter what size they were, it was the same thing that you captured. The citrate was more effective than the particle. So again, the best way to make cancer is to get it so you can. So we'll go on then now to adaptive response. Now adaptive response is kind of an interesting thing. If you have chromosome aberrations and dose, if you go ahead and you have this number of spontaneous chromosome aberrations, you give a very small dose, about the same. You give a big dose, you get this. But if you give a little dose before you give the big dose, you only get about half as many aberrations as you would have predicted. Now what's that tell you? What's that tell you? That's kind of interesting, isn't it? <laughs> a little bit like the uh, crocodile from the deep movie, you know, and kids have that knife and say, that's not a knife, this is a knife. <laughs> pull it out and the kids uh, got stimulated very quickly, didn't they? They lay out. I think in a sense that's what's happening with these low doses. You give them a small dose, you stimulate the defense mechanism, <clears throat> all of the enzymes upregulate, and when you hit them with a big dose, they don't do as much damage as you thought you were going to. I'm just showing you a few examples of these. There's a ton of these. I could spend a day on each one of these. I just picked out some examples to show you. So this shows that if you give a small dose, followed by a big dose, there's an effect that will repair it or an adaptive response. Um, so some of these, this is cancer frequency in Gibbs dose. You go down to very low doses, then you get some stuff in the air. Again, indicating that for plutonium, there's things to repair it. This also provides a scenario for intervention. That means that we can maybe do something to modify the outcome. But if you think about it this way, it's really neat because then you can think about modifying. You don't have to accept one hit, one mutation, one cancer. One hit, modify it, no cancer. So that's what we're trying to do with this project. This is just some of the uh, relative risk functions. Now we go on to genomic instability. Now genomic instability the old way we used to think about mutations. After cell is mutated by radiation, all those progeny mutate, mutated mutations are rare events. And these rare events that are responsible for cancer. So you get something that looks like this. What really happens is you radiate a cell, and after it's been this a very frequent event, see it over there a little bit. It's a frequent event, and after the cell divides a number of times, it divides and looks very normal. And all of a sudden, down here about 15 cell generations later, cells start to die, they start to mutate, they start to find breaks in the chromosomes, they start to have aberrations, they start to have mutations, they have mitotic failure, and all of this then is a precursor to cancer. But what that tells you again is that you've got some time up here where you can do something about the radiation exposure. You can modify the outcome. Now, there's been a lot of work now, even with these antioxidants, the vitamins, and things like that, that you can modify it, the induction of genomic instability. Kind of Remember when I first started in this game, I went to a society called the Environmental Mutagen Society, and you've got the saying to develop a mutation test that you can test everything in the environment seems to mutation producing everything was. And he was going around singing about this. And I heard him talk two years ago, and he said, well, you know, I found out there's a lot of things in the environment that have I need to change. A lot of things are free radical scavengers. A lot of the vitamins in here, the vegetables in here, fruits have a lot of anti mutants in here. So by the time he got through this talk, this time he says, eat today, he's going to be all right. <laughs> Before he said, don't eat cooked meat, don't do this, don't get behind the diesel, etc., etc. But uh, so now it looks like that's why we can actually do some of these things. Radiation doesn't act like the body. With this new knowledge, then we can start actually intervening. This is just a graph of some of the genomic instability. You have valves, sea mice. There's black mice and white mice. One of the sense they will. One's resistant. Now this tells you again that there's something that's genetic back there. We're talking about. Some of us are genetically more susceptible and prone to any kind of environmental insult than others. I look around the audience here. Some of you are more sensitive than others. We all know old we'll, Uncle we'll Henry that's going to get back today and then get hundred. Okay. That's a 
and how many jobs do we study? These jobs have changed and that's what we need. And that's one of the problems that we have, see, now is to make sure that we understand what genes are there that make us either radiation sensitive or radiation resistant. Now that we can see glance genes very rapidly. In fact, I heard a talk the other day where they said, by 25 years from now, each of us will carry a card with our entire gene sequenced on it. We'll take it to the doctor and they'll give it to him and say, well, you're a citizen with this drug, this drug, this drug. This will work, this won't work. We'll base our treatment on our genetic background. That would be one. Only problem is if the insurance company finds out about the genetic background. That's going to be a certain problem. So we've just gone through all of these. Uh, so we've had to shift the way we think about radiation a little bit. Uh, Adaptive response, first adaptive percentages of the facts. There are actually some things that happen that we can express as well as the increase it. If the reverse bystander, you don't have to give cells to respond. Understanding the importance of that and how to modify it. Gene mutation versus gene reduction. You radiate the cell, the whole block of genes up right away. The whole block of genes. It's really good. You can tell what they are. Major genetic imperatives, imperatives, and cell types. Always see you can tell what they are. So we don't rely now on mutations as much as we do the gene reduction. And genomic instability versus the solution. <laughs> genomic instability is one of the places where you can say, well, radiation can induce genomic instability, but then can be multiplied to result in cancer. And it can result in a major growth response. Okay. So we've got two or three of these phenomena that look like the decreasing events. At least one may actually put it in here. Now, so a bomb on radiation goes to the back. There's no question about that. Now, what a lot of the people that work concerned with and work with at high radiation doses, I'm not the first to ask or to, to, to question whether or not they should or shouldn't be compensated. I don't know. Whether or not we were lied to, deceived, and that's not my area there. All I know is what I know. And that was that I was raised in Southern Utah. And it seemed to me like they would announce all of the tests and let us know when they happened. In fact, I remember at least one time when they had the little truck that went around town and announced that there's a fallout cloud coming, everyone should go indoors. In 1953, I was. Uh, I got in high school in 56, so I was probably going out playing ball and playing on the county going to the middle of the game. Wouldn't be much to do anyway. So there were clouds and there were exposures, and those exposures were high relative to any place else in the world. But I just want to remind the radiation good cell color of four mutants and four carcinogen. Scientific advances say that low dose of radiation produce different. Okay. I'm not here to try to convince you one way or another which way these are going to go in terms of basic standards. They're different. And the way I see them now, they seem to be going towards less effect than towards more effect. Radiation is very beneficial in medical diagnosis and treatment. Uh, the radiation industry contributes billions of dollars to the economy. An awful lot of good that's done with it. I think in anything we have to evaluate the, the benefits and the risk. But the health effects from environmental level, to me, may be windmills. They've been fun to look at, they've been fun to study. I've enjoyed the devil out of it my whole career. And it doesn't appear to me that they're extremely dangerous. So I'll, I'll let you uh, throw rocks, whatever, now and take some questions. Of the tumors 
uh, that's one of the reasons I think we have to continue to follow these people. Right now, 40% of them are still alive, and that's 60 years ago. And so these people are getting up to my age and older. And so young people are more sensitive to radiation than old people. Okay? The time of onset of the disease is dependent on the dose. The higher the dose, the quicker the diseases come on. Does that answer? Uh, so, so. As a function of age, if you're younger, it's earlier. The, the age of onset, the leukemias, for example, came up about 15 years after the fall, 10 to 15 years. At the time, we, when we first started getting that, it looked like that's all we're going to get with leukemias. And the solid tumors could start coming up. And the solid tumors then, and that, that excess started coming up. But see, this is all a statistical game. You don't actually look at somebody and say, oh, you've got radiation and there's cancer. They just can't tell. That's another one of the things we're trying to do in this program is to be able to find markers of radiation and there's cancer. If we could do that, that would be wonderful. Then we'd say, oh, there's a radiation and there's short look. Yours was caused by the fact you smoke, that you eat a lot of salt and pork.
So when you hit this one cell, all of us neighbors turned on this they thought pills at you. We're gonna help you out. Get out of here. <laughs> you know? So they focus in and kill that cell and that eliminate the population. But one of the big questions is one you've hit on, and that is how do you explain such a long time between the event and the cancer? And it's a tough one, and it makes it very hard to do the epidemiology study. You can't have a hard time following the population. Three and a half months later, they detected cancer in the throat growing so fast that he died in three months. And they said he was 
from the I-131, it's called second hit. How or what should we do to try to test the person and see if they are, are carrying it before they take medical radiation? That's, that's a really uh, a good question, a uh, uh, sad uh, situation. Uh, we're really we're really up against it on that. You know, you can you can go and you can go and look at his chromosomes. You can go and you can check what genes are being turned on already and say, well, you've already been exposed. You can choose not to now. The flip side of that, I guess, if you have to have the radiation therapy, the lung cancer might go. And so, you know, it's it really a tough situation. And I, I don't really have the answer for you. I, all I know is that, the, for example, now the astronauts are planning a trip to Mars. And I'm on an NCRP committee to look to see if somebody has had previous radiation exposure with therapy, whether they should let them go into the space shuttle. Uh, not space shuttle, but the trip to Mars. The trip to Mars is a year there, a year, a year to get there, a year there, and a year to get back. There's all kinds of good potential for some radiation exposure all over there to a very different radiation environment than we have here. And so they're asking us to do a study to see should we let them go if they had previous radiation therapy. And then the astronauts say, just tell us about it and let's go. But the astronauts are going to be able to cast. But anyway, that's a tough problem. I was interested in your comments on the early days of developing standard susceptible Right. Uh, we call it a specific a long time ago. When I think the acceptable standard was three grand or grand federal right. so we had to stop it when it was so cool. Yeah. 
these interactions. You just never know. My question is, how can we in the United States say to other
Right, 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 right. And Mark, Southern Park County, the little tiny band up in Northern Park County, uh, or Eastern, but almost all of Park County is an island that is totally surrounded from the left. Well, it's got to be up in the north area. It's the best stuff itself. On the top is nine counties. And then another county, I forgot the name of the county. And then Mojave County in Arizona. So we could surround it. And I'm wondering what strange manner of science created this little island here in the middle of all this coverage where the people that no, I, uh, I, I hate to admit science is even involved. I hate to admit science is even involved. I think a lot of that is the political uh, decisions they're made. And I think they made the decision based on the Gold Street construction. So, like I say, there's no science involved. I think frustration. Yeah. Senator Yes. That's good political. If I'm going to get you elected, I'm going to get elected, I'm going to say, I'm concerned about you. You've been wrong. I'm going to do everything I have to have to give you some money. And, and, that, and that's a good way to get elected. I'm not running for the office, so I don't care. But if I were running for office, I'd, I'd, I'd fix that being hit. Because we know they've been exposed. We know that there's a relationship between cancer and radiation. And we know a lot of people will get cancer. And rather than fighting in the business with us, you pay them all off. And I think that's, but then you say, oh, how many do you want to pay off? What about the people in North Dakota where they had some rain out? What about the people from state New York? We want to pay everybody off who gets cancer? Can't afford it, folks. So we have to do something to make your constituency happy and get reelected. I don't know what to do. Our county just didn't have to. They must not have a political cloud. <laughs> See now, Senator Domenici from New Mexico is the one that was really pushed starting this new low-dose research project. And he pushed that in the face of a lot of people who didn't want to do it. Because they said, oh, we can't find anything out. When we first put out the call for proposals, the roar from the scientific community was audible. He says, hey, we can't even see anything down there. And we just said, hey, don't fly there. Who did apply developed techniques where they could see something down there and they could actually do something good. And so it's been one of those things when we first started, nobody wanted to apply. But now we go lined up the miles. Nevada, where they 
where they may let it go, they dig holes. So yeah. there could be some residual radiation so not connected with fallout and right, right, right. And a lot of those places have, uh, they normally have a lot of other things too. A lot of the mines are changing. Regarding Fallon, there's no additional radiation exposure from the test that was near there. Uh, none. That was fully contained. They yeah, showed that again and again from the studies of the kids and the children that got leukemia. It was definitely not caused by radiation from the test that was near found. That's fully contained underground. Do you think that they did that as a parent? Not necessarily, no. They haven't seen a correlation with that either. Because a lot of the parents came from out of town as well. Go ahead. Uh, this radiation harm is just a bit of all of Well, uh, a lot of people say radiation harm is just. Now, I don't know if you people are familiar with that term. But radiation harm is basically saying that a little bit of radiation is good for you. And there are people who are saying, well, I'll have a little source of it with that every night. <laughs> <laughs> and I just about to write it down. But uh, I can go along with adaptive responses and alterations, but it's really hard for me. I guess because of what I was trying to do. You know, remember one of my first radiation classes, they said, well, taking a TV set and shooting with a 30 off stick and hoping to improve the quality of the sound is about like radiating something and hoping to make it better. Because of radiation, because usually you don't make it better, it makes it worse. But with adaptive response, then it does appear that low doses can actually be protected. And then we know that any vitamins, lots of minerals, lots of other things, if you give too much, it's poison. If you give too little, it doesn't really get that. If you give just enough right about it, or get the oxygen response. So there's a lot of people who push this hormesis idea, trying to find out what exactly would be the optimal amount. Several studies where they put things in shielding and reduce the radiation background, but increase the damage. And so a lot of people talk on these, because I have a hard time with the first one. Dr. Uh, regarding plutonium injection, or even breathing in radon, can't, uh, I'm trying very hard to understand everything you're saying. Am I correct in saying that you are saying that radiation is a lousy cancer inducer, even though it is an excellent cell killer? Right. With plutonium and radon ingestion or breathing and fever, uh, wouldn't am I correct that what I've heard prior to coming to the period of this evening, that plutonium and radon can increase cancer induction? Uh, especially with a large amount of plutonium ingestion, yes or no, or am I incorrect on that? Plutonium and radon are both alpha emitters. Yes. Okay, they give off the same kind of particles, almost exactly the same kind of energy. So if I inhale radon, uh, alpha particle from radon hits one of my cells, that cell doesn't know if it's been hit by an alpha particle. Plutonium or from radon, they respond the same. Now, the data on uranium miners shows without a question of a doubt that high doses of radon produce cancer. Okay. We have a lot of dog data where we had animals inhale plutonium. Now, if you ingest plutonium, it just goes through and comes out. Okay. Almost none of it's absorbed. Almost none of it has range enough to do any damage. If you inhale insoluble plutonium particles, they go into your lung, they fall in your lung. They stay there for a very long time, sit and bang away at the lung cells. But we did all these dog studies, and yes, indeed, you can produce lung cancer with the tongue. No question. It requires quite a bit. Now, we haven't had any experience at all with producing lung cancer in people with the tongue because we haven't had any people exposed. We had the thing they call the IPP club people who have plutonium in the urine. And that was a bunch of people at Los Alamos who had inhaled plutonium, and they followed those people who were like fine and didn't see any increase. But now, my acting in Russia, those folks didn't take very good care of the workers. And they were breathing a lot of plutonium. They got people there in Russia where they have huge plutonium burden. They have radiation pneumonitis, radiation fibrosis. In fact, I was listening to talk the other day the guy got up and said, well, was a lady that could give you the talk. She said, you know, we didn't see near as much cancer in the women as we did in the men. And so I said, wait a minute. I said, wait a minute. I thought that the women, 
in Russia, the ones that did most of the separation and had most of the exposure. He says, oh yeah, that's true, but they died with five groceries from the United States. So if you get run over by a truck, there's pretty good chance you're not <laughs> but, but yes, you can produce with, uh, cancer. Plutonium radon are about 20 times as effective as x-rays in producing cancer. That's why the fact that 20 comes from. But it's going to be bigger than that, okay? It's not 200,000, which is Boston. Okay, it's more like 20. I understand you Right, there's a number of drugs and, and treatments that they're giving to try to protect the normal cells. Now, when you're doing your radiation therapy, you want to kill the cancer cells. So you focus it, and then what you can do, uh, there's a lot of vitamins and actors and radio protective to try to protect the normal cells. And that, that seems to be a, 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 a very useful thing. In fact, NASA has got quite a few grants funded where they're looking at the radio protectors to get their astronauts. I think we're going to shut it down. Oh, we still have genetic memory propagation. And will, each cell has a determinate amount of times that it will reproduce itself. And uh, uh, now, uh, of course, oxygenation will affect it. Not just how many times it will reproduce itself, but it will affect it on the, la the term span of each cell. Now, my question is, does the radiation only affect the oxidation of the cell, or does it also cause a, micro, uh, uh, a magnetic molecular breakdown? When, you, when, when radiation hits a cell, it deposits a lot of energy in that cell. And that energy is capable of breaking chemical bonds, causing chromosome damage, and so on. And we used to think that that was the main way that it caused cancer. Now we find you radiate one cell, the oxidative status of the whole population changes, and that change in oxidative status seems to be as important as the individual brain in the individual because cell. Because the genetic now, memory of the cell has been affected, right? Pardon? The genetic memory of each cell has been affected. Is that, is that why? Uh, if it has a mutation in it, it's passed on. But again, radiation is very good at breaking chromosomes and killing cells, and not very good at causing mutations. Now, if you want to make mutations, I got a ton of nitrosal compounds, a ton of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that I can put in and make almost all the cells mutate and get a cancer in each and every animal. Okay? okay. And so that, that's why I'm saying this is not a real good music. Now, then why would the people in Chernobyl have had a higher incidence of thyroid cancer than people in Chernobyl? Because they got a lot more dose of the thyroid. They had a huge amount of vitamin 131 they inhaled, the thyroids. Now the doses were only in the children, and only in the children is where they saw the cancers. They didn't see cancers in adults. Only in the children, the children have smaller thyroids, they take up the iron more effectively, they had a huge radiation doses of thyroid, the children got the thyroid cancer. Over age 15, almost nobody. Under age 15, we got quite a few. We want to shut her down now. I think we've had about all this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Get her done. <clears throat> well, yeah. Hi. Is this tape going to be available anywhere on the internet? Or? Oh, you did? Well, I think it's just a hand over, so I think it's done. Okay. Thank you. 